without further ado, please help me welcome our panelists. Panelists, can you please introduce yourself, stating your name, title, company, and your UNC degree? And Amber, we'll go ahead and start with you. All right. Um, my name is Amber Simon, and I'm the founder and CEO of the Second Page Career Services. Um, in my former life, and I guess you could say current, um, uh, human resources executive. And um, I decided to start the second page because um, I felt like at this stage in my career, um, I could give back a little bit more um, to my community around me and help folks, especially through our, this COVID pandemic, um, really shape their career where they want it to go and not look at it as a job and more so as a career. So um, that's what I am currently doing. And I graduated from UNC in 2001. Thank you, Amber. Efrain? Hello, everybody. How's it going? My name is Efrain Madera, but please call me Efra. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his. I currently serve as a university relations manager for uh, CBS Health, where I help support our Los Angeles and San Francisco markets. Um, I graduated from the University of Northern Colorado in 2016 uh, with my degree in broadcast journalism. Thank you, Efra. Michelle? Hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Paquette. I graduated from UNC in May of 2001 with my degree in business management. I am currently the senior project manager for executive compensation at the Walt Disney Company. Blah, that is a mouthful, um, but that is my current job title. I actually just made the switch to compensation this year. Most of my career has actually been in talent acquisition as well. But currently, I'm just helping um, kind of bring some ideas and concepts to life um, within the executive con compensation team. Thank you, Michelle. Dina? Hello, my name is Dina Lemos Garcia. I am a human resource manager at the city of Greeley. And uh, I provide services for the employees for, for the life of the time that they're with our organization, from the time that they're hired to the time that they decide to leave. Um, and uh, my degree from UNC was 2005, my bachelor's degree, and then my master's in 2018. Thank you, Dina. And now I wanna hand it over to Thomas, who will be our moderator this afternoon, Thomas. Thank you, Norma. It's a pleasure to be here. I am Thomas Hartman. I am a 2007 alumni from the um, Higher Education Student Affairs Leadership uh, Doctoral Program. And um, I'm currently have the honor of serving as a talent development consultant for the Colorado Workforce Development Council. And so I'll start off with the first question and to let everybody a little bit off the hook. I'm going to give uh, my response first, and then I'll inter ask each one of our panelists to jump in. So the first question is, how did your UNC college experience prepare you for employment after college? And I think that my UNC program prepared me in the philosophy and the practice of student development and leadership. Uh, mostly in student affairs, but it does apply across the board. Uh, specifically, I learned how to manage programs, use and conduct research, and how to implement best practices in policy making. Um, working as a team was an important thing that I learned, and hopefully, how to communicate effectively. So, with that, uh, I'll invite Dina. Okay. So my UNC college experience prepared me for various, um, in various ways. So however, what really stood out for me is I learned excellent organizational skills. I recognized um, what it looked like to meet countless deadlines. I appreciated the many opportunities that I had to work with a diverse um, group of people along with trying to build my network. Um, and then uh, the importance of research, even though sometimes my days were long and my nights were long, um, I certainly appreciated the time that I was able to allow myself to do the research and be able to figure out things myself. Because as I've seen it now, those are some skills that a lot of the organizations are looking for that we oftentimes sometimes forget. Thanks, Dina. Uh, Efra. 
Um, yeah. So I think when I think about my experience at UNC, I actually didn't join the workforce right away. I did um, attend the University of Denver to pursue my master's also in higher education and student affairs. But I think what really prepared me at UNC was one, just allowing to understand what are the resources available to me and how can they support me. Um, I was a part of the cultural centers on campus. I was part of the McNair Scholar Program as well. Um, and really part of those different associations that one, allowed me to have a sense of belonging, but also to continue to build my network um, as I continue to figure out what I wanted to do next. Um, I think one of the other things that I took away from my undergraduate experience was really the ability to take ownership, right? Whether that's solving an issue, whether it's a task that's assigned to me. And I think that's really transitioned into my professional life where I know now that if I have a task that's at hand, how do I take ownership? Do I ask questions? Are there resources? Um, or what can I do to make sure I complete that? And I think that's been one of my biggest takeaways. Thank you. Uh, Michelle, would you like to share some insights? Sure, yeah. I, I think for me, really what my experience at UNC did was really solidify my career interest. I actually went into college thinking I wanted to own my own wedding planning business. That's what I was destined to do uh, out of high school. And so I, you know, I picked a business management major thinking that was a, a good fit to do that. But I still to this day, however many years later, remember sitting in my HR 101 class, right, as I was taking my general business classes, and, and we had a guest speaker come in and, and talk to us about the Americans with Disabilities Act, and I was riveted, nerd that I am, um, just thought that that was absolutely exciting, and so really, I think my experience at UNC opened me up to potential opportunities that I hadn't even thought about when I went into college at first, um, and then allowed me also the opportunity to explore that interest even further. So as you've already heard from a few of the other participants, I also was very involved with a lot of things on campus. And one of the things I did was end up running for student senate. At the time, they had a personnel affairs position, um, which was responsible for all of the hiring um, for students run offices on campus. And so not only did it open me up to an opportunity, but it gave me an experience to really kind of experience what that was like and made sure it's what I wanted to do when I grew up, so to speak. Thank you. Amber, would you share with Hi. us your experience? I would have to agree with what everyone else has said, but um, I, I would say one difference for myself was exposure to diversity of thought. Um, prior to going to UNC, I lived in my own little bubble. I grew up in Parker, Colorado. Um, and so one of the biggest things that I took away from UNC was, and especially knowing that I was going to go into um, human resources as a profession, um, following in my father's footsteps, um, I, I really grabbed a value from that. And to say, outside of my little bubble, there is diversity of thought. There is diversity of um, ethnicity, religion, et cetera, um, that I might not have gotten exposed to otherwise. Um, and that will always carry with me. And I made lifelong um, networking friendships <laughs> and lifelong, you're the godmother of my children friendships at UNC. So I took away from it the professional practicalities from the education, but I also took away those very basic human things that say, hey, you know what? Um, outside of my little Parker, Colorado bubble, there's a whole nother world and a diversity of thought. And I do believe that that's helped me in my career. That's wonderful. Didn't Parker just get like one of the most livable <laughs> cities or something? Sure it did. It was, but when I lived in Parker, it was more horses than people, one stop <laughs> sign. <laughs> Still a great place to live. So, um, but, but yeah, um, I would definitely attribute um, a lot of my worldliness at this point um, and to Vish <laughs> um, you know, to the actual diversity of thought at UNC. Thank you. Our second question has to do with what are the knowledge, skills, and abilities that employers are looking for in recent graduates? And I'll invite Michelle to start us off. Sure. Yeah, I'll say as I, I thought about this question, you know, it was, it, it can be, my first initial answer sometimes is that it depends specifically on the job, right? I think a lot of jobs that you're going to be looking for, some of which, especially even in Disney, uh, are really going to be looking for much more hard skills or technical skills things. But I think for those of us that are interested really in HR, a lot of it is really about those soft skills or the transferable skills that you can bring to the position. Um, and so just being able to apply whatever experience you've been able to gain 
on campus or through internships or whatever work experience you have and be able to take those skills and transfer them to your next opportunity is really, um, really going to be key. When I think about, you know, my experience um, and my time here, um, you know, at the company, I think some of the big things that we look for really, I mean, number one, and you hear it quite a, a bit, I'm sure, is communication, but just your ability to have strong communication skills, both written and verbal, be able to get your point across, be able to explain or tell a story um, will really carry you far, I think, in job interviews and in, in, in real life as well. I think another one that's key for us is flexibility. I will say just from personal experience, a lot of people have an idea of what working for Disney is really like, and it may or may not live up to those expectations. Mm -hmm. So I think really being flexible and being open to opportunities is also really key and understanding kind of how one opportunity can build on another um, is a big one. And then I think a third one that I would probably highlight is collaboration. I think that that is just becoming more and more evident, especially in even now in the environment that we're in, where I think, you know, work is going more and more remote, your ability to reach out and collaborate and find new ways to make those connections and, and build those relationships, that is going to be just even more key as we move forward. And I think even for us, um, within, you know, our company, a lot of our teams, we can be very specialized within HR. So, you know, we've got a team focused on compensation, a team focused on talent acquisition, it's another team that's focused on, you know, labor relations. And so your ability to collaborate not only within your individual team, but to network across other teams to, um, to achieve something is also really key and paramount. Michelle, thank you. That was great. Amber, are you able to tell us a little bit about what knowledge, skills, and abilities you think employers are looking for in recent graduates? Yes, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so I would have to agree absolutely with Michelle, but even more so I would definitely dig down into the this virtual world and ability to adapt. Um, one of the things you probably wouldn't have an advantage of is freshly coming out of college um, would be a long work history. And so I would really lean on saying, hey, here are some of the some of the skills that I picked up even while learning virtually. And it's okay to say that in an interview process and say, hey, you know what? Some of the things that I picked up um, is the ability to function in this adaptable environment and give several examples. If you've had to give um, a presentation virtually because you can't be in the classroom right now, I definitely think that's something you can lean on. Don't be afraid to be boastful of your portfolio. Um, now is a really good time when you don't have a lot of work history and you're really trying to sell yourself at this point and say, hey, here's visually what I've been able to do. Um, so I would also say some of the attributes that I personally look for is that person who is um, really able to say, <clears throat> excuse me, at the end of the day, um, you know what, um, I've, I'm sorry, I, I'm getting messages at the bottom <laughs> asking me to do things. Sorry. Um, one of the things that I would also dig down into as a new graduate looking for a role and trying to sell different attributes, as I would say, ability to communicate, and that's something I'm not doing very well right now. <laughs> um, your ability to communicate, and don't be afraid to take writing samples with you as well. I know that when I was graduating from Montfort, I didn't have a lot of jobs. I had an internship and a bunch of projects that I had to lean on. And being able to be confident and say, hey, and honest and transparent, right, and say, I may not fill out all of these marks here, but I have the ability and the know with all to be able to fill the gaps for you. Another thing that I would say is offer to fill that hole, right? If you've got a problem and you've researched the company well enough and you feel like you can present an answer, don't be afraid to sell that answer. So it's all about tooting your own horn at this point. Um, so that's one of the things that I would definitely say. I'm looking for people who aren't afraid to stick their neck out and say, hey, I may not have it all, um, but I'll do my best to get there. That's great. Thanks, Amber. I have a follow-up question from our audience, and um, any one of you, feel free to jump in. Um, but it's very specific to HR, and the question was, what advice would you give someone looking at getting their first HR-related role? I can give two cents as a newer uh, professional in the HR world. Um, 
do your homework, right? At least for me, I, I, when I heard about HR, I was like, oh, well, HR, but there's, I think Michelle was hitting on it earlier. There's so many functions to HR, right? You know, training and development. You have your talent acquisition. You have, you know, your HR business partners. You have training. Yeah, I think I mentioned training and development. So figure out what do you like and what type of impact do you want to make, right? As you continue um, to explore what HR looks like for you. Or for those of you who are trying to get to a certain point or position in HR, what skills do you need? What career path will uh, take you there, right? So that's what I would say. That was great. Anyone else um, want to specifically address an HR question like that? I, I, would I would recommend highly researching the organization that you're looking to go work for. Um, you want to make sure that your ethics and their ethics, vision, <laughs> and mission are aligned. Um, human resources can be a very sticky place to be sometimes, and I would really lean on reviews from employees, right? Um, you have to decide within yourself where you want to fit in that organization and what kind of organization you want to represent. And if you don't do your research on the organization, HR is a hard and very difficult place to live in space to live in if um, you're not aligned with the organization's values. So I would definitely say do your homework. Don't be afraid to do that. Wonderful. Michelle, I want to ask you another follow-up question because you mentioned your involvement in uh, student life, student activities. And so um, how, how might you use that experience in an interview? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I, I think and I think you've heard it from all of us, I think really just your opportunities to get involved on campus are, are out there, right? And I would say take advantage of them, first of all, because not only does it build your network, but it does build your experience and it builds the stories that you can draw from in an interview as well. So the more of those types of experiences that you have, so like I said myself, I, I was on Student Senate, I was very involved in the Women's Resource Center, um, involved with the Best Buddies program. So I had kind of different aspects of my life that I was able to get involved with and on campus. And then those created different experiences that I could then draw from within the interview. For me personally, I, I always say, if you can answer an interview question with a story, um, that can be very powerful, right? If you are able to really describe an experience um, of something that then showcases what you learned or what skill you now have, um, that's that's key. So I think the more you can sort of get involved in those different um, experiences, it just gives you more of those to draw from. Yeah, that's, I would also yeah I would also like to compound a little bit on what everyone else said too. I, I also believe that the college experience gives you an opportunity to step out of your comfort zone. It mm -hmm. allows you to step out into what you fear. Um, not that it's okay to make mistakes, but college would be a great time for you to learn some of those things and learn from some of those some opportunities that come your way. So it really is, um, just as everyone said, clubs, opportunities for uh, internships or work study or um, volunteer work, just to be able to give yourself that experience and then figure out how creatively you can attach that to whatever job you're looking for. Is it an HR? Is it whatever it looks like? Um, because as an HR role, those um, skills also are very diverse within each job. Um, and so you can figure out what do you need to compound on while you're in college to then make it more effective for you when you are looking for that job. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to add a little bit. I've heard soft skills several times. And uh, one of the things that, one of the labels that we like to use is transportable skills. And so a lot of the transportable skills that are coming up um, in Colorado, at least, are problem solving, critical and creative thinking, collaboration, communication, and ethical reasoning, uh, digital literacy, and then being agile, really being able to keep up with the continuously, the continuous shifting of work. And, and that sort of leads into another question that I see here online from one of our audience members. Um, Alex asks, has transitioning to online slash distance work negatively impacted things like talent acquisition? Is it harder to find people to hire or is it harder to um, hire people once you found them? 
I can speak from my business's perspective. Um, I have had a flux of people who are home, so they naturally have a little bit more wiggle room as far as being able to get their resumes out and ask for career coaching assistance. So right now, um, I think it's actually been really helpful, um, at least from my perspective, in the sense that um, people have the time and energy. If I have, if I want to interview for a role in New York and I live in Denver, um, it's a matter of setting up a quick Zoom meeting. It's not a matter of setting up a flight. Um, I've also found that um, people are saying, hey, you know what, I am home. Um, I do have a little bit more time to focus my search and not look for another job. I can really start building my career. So I do think this virtual environment has opened up an opportunity for people to find a little bit more time in their day to really focus their careers and to really think about what they want to do and not necessarily what they have to do. Um, so that's been my experience. And prior to leaving corporate America, um, and, and I left at the end of those, or at the start of the Zoom world, um, I, it was rocking and rolling as far as recruiting and hiring because it was so much easier to get people scheduled for interviews than it was trying to get people in buildings. So that's just from a really practical standpoint. Yeah, I, I, I fully wholeheartedly agree. I think with everything Amber has said, I think from our perspective too, it, it really has just broadened the net when you think about, um, you know, with our company. So I am actually based in Southern California now. Um, and traditionally, I, I would say over the last few years, we've actually started to see some more flexible remote work locations. Um, but typically it's still been, you know, if you want to work for Disney, you're kind of in Florida or California, um, you may be a little bit in New York. So um, I think really this shift, what we've seen is it has just broadened the the scope of where you can be and also, you know, the talent pool that we have to pull from as well. So I would think it, it definitely has not hindered. I, th I think it's in a huge way, it's positively impacted not only our ability to find talent that we are looking for, but also, you know, for the, the talent to find the right company for them. Because now you can, you know, I think more and more companies are kind of looking at and looking at remote work uh, differently. Great. Yeah, Go ahead. Have I would have to agree as well. So here at the city, um, we started interviewing uh, virtually with Skype um, and we wanted to start being able to access people who applied who lived in different um, states because we didn't want to always have to fly people in. It was very expensive to fly people in to interview. And so I agree with Michelle, it's, it really expanded our ability to find that great talent that we were um, looking for. And, and then with, as we are now, it just really, um, made things go a lot quicker. So we actually had to do more things much quicker, which is fine um, than we anticipated um, in moving virtual interviews, meeting people virtually, still having those great connections um, and saved us all a lot of money within, within that whole realm of, of movement. Thanks, Dina. I want to acknowledge that we are getting quite a few questions in the Q&A, so I will do my best to sort of sprinkle those throughout, um, but I'll get, I'll get to our next prepared question, and then as I'm able, I will include some of those audience questions as well. So this will be for uh, Dina to get us started. What tips can you share for making the right impression in a virtual environment? Yeah, so when I think about virtual and in-person, I, I don't find that there's many differences. You, you still want to have that great eye contact. You still want to have, you still want to have the ability to articulate what you're saying. Um, you still want to dress to impress. Even virtually, it's just from the waist up. Um, you want to still make sure that you have those connected. With the virtual component, you definitely want to make sure that you have a location with great connections. So do a test run with a friend or somebody who you can help with that. Um, also, the location is very important. So as much as we love coffee shops, that probably isn't the best place to have an interview or a conversation with a potential organization. Um, and then the last thing that I just want to mention is really the placement of your, of your camera. So you don't want to have the hiring committee seeing up your nose or at your head. You know, you definitely want to give that great space between your face and uh, the camera so that we people can actually um, really view and still try to connect with your nonverbal um, cues within the interview process as if it were in person. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, 
Efra, can you, can you answer the question about the virtual environment and a little bit of advice for us? Yeah, so I think I would definitely echo what was just said, right? I think um, Gina hit on a lot of the notes I was gonna talk about, but I would say uh, just a different perspective that I would add on to that, right? Um, is prepare in advance, right? Again, like treat it like a normal interview, um, but more than that, um, what's your body language saying, right? On camera, are you nodding? Are you taking notes? Are you, you know, how, do you have eye contact? Are you staying engaged? So how are you giving folks those cues that you're interested and in still engage with them? Overall is something that I would say. Um, I think in addition to that though, is I recognize, right? I personally was a first college student, was working, lived with family. So, you know, if you don't have a space, right? Where you can go ahead and, and have a nice background, try a virtual background. Um, for you all that are students and are interacting with different employers, um, one thing that I would share is try to familiarize yourself with different video systems, right? You have WebEx, you have Zoom, you have Skype. Um, so I think for students, right, you all are seeing a lot of pressure, right? Being school, like students, you know, you have families and working. So I would just say try to um, maybe learn about those platforms beforehand just to give you that peace of mind for that virtual interview. Amber, do you have any advice for online interviews? I feel like these guys have said it all. Um, <laughs> my only other addition would really be promptness, timely. Um, one of the things that I have noticed, my only pet peeve has been um, folks are a little bit more lax with start times and end times because of the virtual environment. Um, so my, my, my only addition here at this point would be make sure it is timely. You wouldn't arrive late for any other interview, any other meeting, I would hope. <laughs> Um, so, like, like everyone else says, test out your technology first, do a test run, um, try it even doing a test run with what you're wearing. Um, make sure it's not too bright, make sure it doesn't clash with the light that's in the room. I know those all sound like minor things, but they're all major things if someone's staring at you for an hour and you've got on, and I've got on a bright flowery shirt <laughs> today, um, but it's distracting, right? Um, so, that, those would be my only things. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to ask a little bit different question um, back to the application process. And Ephra, I'll ask you first, what can I do to avoid any pitfalls in the application process? Uh, that's a good question. So I think my, uh, my first tip of advice is know the position that you're applying for, right? Especially if you're applying to various positions within the organization. Um, I think for me, right, one of the downfalls that comes in is I have individuals who will submit their resume for like Deloitte or in a different organization. And then I'm like, ah, well, that's not, you know, I'm not recruiting for Deloitte, that's a CBS health. So that's a big red flag off the, off the bat. Um, but then in addition to that, I think it's important to, in regards to how are you tailoring, tailoring your resume when you're submitting it through the application system, right? Are you using specific language that um, the company itself is using that's on the job description? Um, I think those are all very important things as well. Um, and then one of the other things that I will say is read, read, read all of the questions that are on the application and make sure you understand them, right? I've had individuals who, you know, say that they don't want to take a drug and background test, but they actually do, right? But they read it wrong, so then their application gets, you know, rejected. So make sure that you're taking the time to read those questions and make sure you're answering them correctly so you avoid some of those minor pitfalls because sometimes we unfortunately lose really good talent. Um, because they maybe misanswered a question. And we're happy to help, but it takes a while to, to uh, backtrack on some of those steps. Thank you. Amber, can you respond in, as well? What are some of the pitfalls sure. in the application process? Um, just to expand a little bit more, I would say just say no to the click apply button function. Don't do it. <laughs> Let it go. Um, if it's a role that you are truly interested in, again, I go back to you are not looking for a job. Hopefully, you're looking to build a career. Um, so take the time. Research the, the, the company again. Um, take the time to customize your cover letter. Take the time to customize your resume and send it in through the organization. Do not hit quick apply. <laughs> it doesn't give you the opportunity to tell your story, um, especially if you're in an area where you are a new graduate, and we talked about this before, you've got to kind of show off a little bit more um, because you might not have the work history. So do not hit quick apply. Um, the other thing that I would say is don't be afraid to follow up in the application process. Um, if you've applied, this is now the time. If you've done your research, you've kind of looked within your network, 
ask around and say if there's anyone you should follow up with if it isn't immediately available within the job posting. Um, but don't be afraid. If you've gotten through an interview process, don't be afraid to follow up if it's been a while since you've heard from HR or your recruiter. Um, sometimes, and I can honestly say it's a matter of, you know what, I, I get to 4 o'clock and now I need to look at resumes or now I need to follow up with people that I've already spoken to. And sometimes a nice reminder is, you know what, it's 4 o'clock the following day. Um, so it's okay to do that. Um, the other thing that I would say is, during your, I, I look at the application process and building your career is more than just filling out this one application. You were really trying to get yourself out there at the time, and every opportunity is filling out an application. And so I always tell some of my some of my career clients, my coaching clients, um, don't be afraid to tap into your network. If you're fresh starting out in your career, send out an email to family and friends that says, hey, I'm fresh starting out in my career, and I am looking for a role in human resources. And although you may not be hiring right now or you don't know anybody right now, also attach your resume to that communication, you guys. So look at everyone who surrounds you and everyone you speak to as an application process. Um, and those would be my biggest pieces of um, advice right now. That's great advice. Thank you so much. Michelle, I, I very specifically want to ask you this question. Um, what are some of the questions that you recommend I ask during an interview? Yeah, I think so often, I think some people can be nervous to ask a question in an interview or think they're worried about asking the wrong question. And I would say it's, it really, um, it really is in your best interest to questions during the interview and and think about it and remember that the interview really is kind of a, a two-way street. It's, it is obviously an opportunity for the company to figure out if you're a right fit for them, but it's also an opportunity to, for you to figure out if that company is a right fit for you and sort of keep that in. Um, so I think some questions that um, that I really like or have particularly kind of passed, one of those is, and it, if, goes back to something you've heard already a lot is do your research, right? So if you come in with um, and are able to ask something about something you've seen on their website, right? Anything about maybe how the company was founded or um, the company's mission statement, can you expand a little bit more on that for me? Or can you tell me what your sort of top values in the company are based on, you know, things I saw? I think a question like that really should your homework that you are invested and that you're really interested in learning more about the company as a whole. And I apologize, I'm getting a connection. My internet's unstable, so I hope it's gonna hold through here. But um, another great one that you can ask that doesn't, that isn't always on a company's website, but I like to ask about what are some of their key initiatives for the year and all you're applying for can help them achieve those initiatives. I think that though will give you some really good insight into what they value as a company and where they're headed as an organization. And then how, you know, what the, the position is at your plan, how that role is going to actually fit into that framework. So you can really get a good idea of kind of maybe then what's going to be expected. I think probably another one that has been uh, of mine that I, I've been asked a few times is really about it's about the team and and about asking what skill sets do you already have on the team and what skill sets are you maybe looking to add because um, i think again that really shows you a little bit more about the culture of the team that you'll be working with and gives you an opportunity to uh, to understand more specifically what it is they're looking for to complement the team so if if they if you find out that the team is already a lot of big thinkers and you're another big thinker Maybe that's fine because maybe that is what they're looking for. But if the team is a lot of big thinkers and you are an, a detail oriented person, maybe that's your niche. And that's what you can then offer up as what you can really add to and complement to what they already have on their team um, at the moment. So those are just some examples. But again, I think it just goes back to doing your research and, and don't, not, don't be afraid and have a few questions really at least in your back pocket ready to ask. Thank you for those are all wonderful questions. I want to get on to the next question and again acknowledge that we are getting questions from the audience. We're going to hold most of those to the end if they're not answered. So this one, uh, Amber, if you would start us off again, um, how can I get experience when the jobs I'm looking at ask for one or more years of experience? Oh, you guys, can you hear me? Hmm. 
You're good. Okay. I got dropped off, so I'm going to try and <laughs> see if I can get back. Um, can you maybe go to the – has anyone else answered yet? I'm sure. sorry. I just dropped. Yeah. I'll get back I'll, I'll come, I'll I'll come back to you, Amber. Sounds so, great. Um, Dina, would you be able to answer the question, What? how do I get experience when – I need that first job and they're asking for more than a year of experience. Yeah, absolutely. So my ideas to throw out would be getting experience through internships and some of them might be unpaid. And so if you're really looking for that experience, you might take that unpaid internship, even though it's probably not what you want to do. Um, doing some volunteer work, um, seeing if you can do anything at the college um, with volunteer work. Maybe it's not an internship. Maybe it's a work study position. Um, sometimes there's part-time work that's out there that you could gain experience in addition to maybe some temporary work through the temporary services. Again, it's not what's best, but it's what, what is out there to be able to add or compound to the resume that you're, that you're preparing for your next role. Thanks, Dina. Mm -hmm. Efra, would you like to jump in and how do I get experience when they ask for experience? Yeah, so I think one uh, critical thought that I would put out there is so everybody was mentioning transferable skills earlier, right? So although many times they say one or two years of experience, we'll pause, right? Maybe you don't have direct experience working in that field, but do you have previous work experience, volunteer experience, and are you able to articulate that um, as you apply? So that would be my first step, right? One, is it a preferred qualification or is it just you know, what they actually need. Um, another thing that I would do, um, or I guess I would just start thinking about is um, if you are, if you do have a gap in your skill sets, right? Um, apply, are you getting calls back? Um, and if you're not, where are those, those gaps? And what can you do in your current role, whether that's ask for additional skills or different projects to go ahead and fill in those gaps to make you a more marketable candidate in the future. Um, so I think that's, that's what I would do. I'm in that situation. Thank you. Amber. Okay, I'm back. So um, my only other piece of advice, because I feel like everybody has said it already, um, is if you're still looking for experience, um, internships, of course, are great. Volunteering, of course, is great. But I also say and advise people to go to um, the Small Business Administration and the Minority Business Administration, women's specialty groups, whatever demographic you fall within, um, and see if they've got any entrepreneurs who are looking for interns who would like some help. One of the easiest things you can do is assist someone who's starting a new business because you're going to learn from the bottom floor every intricate piece of starting a business, right? And consequently, you get exposure to a lot of different areas. So if you've got the time and you've got the ability, and if you're willing to volunteer your time in exchange for experience and an endorsement, um, I, I would definitely check with some of those organizations and say, hey, can you connect me with an entrepreneur who needs an intern who knows how to do web development? Um, I, I know for myself, I'm currently looking for somebody who can who can write <laughs> who's a writer um and so I, I would love to look at someone and say hey you know what you're a new student looking for experience I, I, i'd love to have you join the team a couple of part-time hours um so with that being said um, it's all about creativity and, and tapping into the world around you and saying where else can i use my skill set to make a difference um, and, and really being able to say, hey, this is humble pie time, and I'm building a career. I'm not looking for a job. I can't stress that enough, right? Because um, the job is for the moment. The career is for the long run. Um, so that's what I would do. That's great advice. Thank you. Let me ask um, a question, and then I'm going to turn around and answer it right away. Um, <laughs> uh, I won't be the only one, I promise. There's no salary listed on the job posting. And so when is it appropriate to ask about salary during the interview process? Um, one of the things that I wanna recommend because of my work with the state of Colorado, um, I recommend using, doing some research like many people have said already and uh, looking at the Colorado Labor Market Information website. We affectionately call that the LMI. So the Labor Market Information website has salaries in Colorado broken down to the county level and even in some cases the the big employer level and so you can see what the starting salary is you can see what the average salary is so you go in and form you're not going to ask you know crazy high or you know silly low 
you'll, you'll have a range in mind before you answer that question. And so, uh, Michelle, uh, could you add to that? Yeah, I sure can. I know this one can be a little bit tricky, and I know there's actually been some legislation in this space um, in the not too not too uh, distant past. So I, I will say though that I think it's it's very um, appropriate for you to put your expectations out there even up front. So you may not ask point blank, "What does this position pay?" But I think after you've done your research, like Thomas mentioned, I think it's wholly appropriate for you, um, you know, even as early as a phone screen with a recruiter to say, hey, I'm really looking for a position where I can make at least X, you know, is this position in the ballpark or, you know, range of that? Is that appropriate? I think that's, that's a much better way to put it is kind of putting out what your expectations are and then just gauging to see if, if that's in the ballpark of, of, you know, what they're looking at as well. And, and I, again, I think that's fine to, to bring up even as soon as a phone screen um, with the recruiter. I will say, you know, one thing I want to just add to, to, to what Thomas mentioned, I, I think sometimes, you know, we, we graduate college and we think we get starstruck with all the money we could make. I think when you're doing that research, it's important to keep in mind that, again, like Amber said, you're, you're building your career. So that first job out the gate, you know, maybe you don't go for the average, maybe you go more towards that starting salary range, um, or just at least expect that that's probably what they're going to be more willing to pay. That's great. Dina, can you, can you add to that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, one thing I do want to state is that every HR professional will have their own um, idea about the various questions that you're asking. And so even though we might be a little different, uh, I think that they're all valuable. And so for me, I feel like, um, from my perspective, salary negotiation should be discussed at the time of the conditional offer. And the reason I say that is because if they don't offer you, if they aren't offering you a position, then it becomes a new point, right, to have even the discussion of the um, salary. However, if the employer brings it up at the time of the interview, then that's a great time for you to have that conversation. And then I, I agree with Michelle that you do your research. You determine what real experiences you bring to the table and then determine really where you align with what they're offering. So if you bring minimal to the table, then you're going to have them in and to ask for a higher one, even though we want to negotiate, we have to be real with what that looks like and, and how much we want to invest in our, in our first career or first job and what does that really look like. And so thinking about that before you uh, engage in that conversation. Great. We are, I know we have several questions. I'm going to ask one more question of the, of the panel. And, and that's basically, do you have a, a final tip for UNC students or recent graduates, fellow alumni who are launching their job search or changing career fields? And Efra, would you start, start us off, please? Yeah, so I um, I get to work um, specifically in my role. I work with um, a lot of university students, right? I work with our interns, um, folks who went through our internship or are looking for entry level positions. So I think one of the tips that I would have specifically for recent grads, right, is really be critical about thinking about a career path, right? Oftentimes, at least myself, I was guilty of it. I left undergrad and I was like, well, I'm, went, I'm ready to be a manager, right? I'm ready. I want to make really good money. I want to lead a team. But I realized right early on that there was skills that I had to pick up on, right? There was, you know, different opportunities that I didn't partake in or I didn't have. So for me, it was really thinking about where do I want to go next? And how will this next position allow me to get there, right? So to give you all a little bit of context, right? When I was at the University of Denver, I knew I wanted to get into recruiting, specifically university recruiting. I didn't have that experience, right? So I saw it on a lot of committees that gave me that experience. I took a part-time HR job. Um, but then in the future, right, as I continued and where I'm at now, after my first job in student affairs, I, I specifically looked for roles that would give me the skill sets I needed to now get into talent acquisition. So be patient, new grads, um, be patient, but take the steps to get where you want to be, I would say. Great advice. Amber, can you give us a, a tidbit? I will definitely try. Um, I, I would say the number one thing is I, I'm, I'm a big culture person. And so I say be your authentic self. You do not want to get into a, an organization where it's just not going to work out, right? Um, you work for a slaughterhouse up in Greeley, but you're a vegan, <laughs> right?
right? Um, these things absolutely matter. Um, research the organization, make sure you know what you're getting into and make sure that you can live with that for the next few years. This is where you're fundamentally going to be molding and shaping your career. And if it's an experience that you're not enjoying, if it's an experience you're not learning from, then it's an experience you could probably have bypassed with a little bit more of a very specific um, role search. Um, so don't be afraid to sit and think about, hey, where do I want to fit into this workforce? Um, what industry do I want to work in? And where do I want to fit in within that industry? And once you've really focused your search, then you're better equipped to go out and find an organization that not only fits you and your personal brand and who you represent, and that you'll be able to be reflective of that organization as well. So um, that, that would be my piece of advice. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, Michelle, can you give us uh, another final tip? I can, and I, I will, I'll do my best to be brief. I'm actually going to expand on something that Ethel was, was just saying. I, you know, it, as I said, I graduated back in, in May of 01, and my first job out of college was actually an internship with Disney, and then 9-11 happened. So um, not only were they not hiring full-time, but they also ended all of our internships early. So I actually moved back to Colorado, and, um, you know, I didn't even have a chance to finish that internship. So I went to waitressing. That's what I was with my college degree. Uh, I went back to waitressing for a while and actually went to the UNC career fair the year after I graduated. All of that you can imagine was very, very humbling. Um, but I, I think, again, I'm gonna go back to what I think you've heard a lot of us say already and, that, and that's also to just be open. I ended up getting a job out of that career fair in finance. Um, it was not a job I particularly loved. I was selling insurance and upselling loans and had to collect on loans. And that was not really a great fit for me. But, um, you know, it did, A, get me out of waitressing. Uh, and B, um, you know, it, it did give me some skills that paid off later. What I ended up doing was staying in touch with um, my manager when I was in an internship. And I think somebody mentioned it before of just keeping in touch with your network and sending out your resume. So I actually asked, can I send you my resume every six months? And she said, yes, and, and that's what I did. And it took, took a couple of times, but guess what? A position opened up and I was able to move down and, and then a recruiting job opened up, which is what I had always wanted to do, kind of similar to what Ephra said. And I didn't have everything that was on the job description because they were looking for a very specific kind of career path to become a recruiter and I didn't have that, but I knew it the time that the manager really treated those sales positions. So what did I my sales experience from the finance job? And I really played that up. And I, I was bold in the internet and said, I, I know I don't have your XYZ bullet, what I do bring to the table. So my tip really, I guess, is threefold. It's, it's be open, it's maintain those networks, and it's be bold when you do get the opportunity you want. Thank you so much for that. Dina, Share us wisdom. Yes. Um, so I have a few tips that really I, I feel like are maybe even maybe basic, but so important. So practice your interviewing skills um, and really rehearse those. I, I know it sounds silly, but talk to yourself in a mirror, talk to your pet, call a friend, really be able to activate your speaking voice and say those words aloud because sometimes what's in our brain doesn't always come out. And so you want to make sure that you practice those. Um, have specific examples prepared. So um, hiring committees don't want to know what you would have done or what you, you might do, but they really want to know your life experience and what you bring to the table and be able to explain those. Um, don't get frustrated through the process um, of your job search. You know, right now, uh, for every 10 positions that people will apply for, you might get one interview. Um, so certainly don't get frustrated and don't give up. And then the last one I feel that is most important, and that's for everybody really, it's to take care of yourself. Take care of yourself in these odd times in this, this odd world. Schedule time to unwind, recharge, um, find things that give you joy and that give you comfort because it'll help you take that next step tomorrow, so. Wonderful advice, thank you so much. I wanna make a couple of mentions. Um, hey Thomas, quick question yes. for you. Please. Actually, I, I think you had mentioned, um, and I think it's an important thing to highlight just as folks prep, 
Do you mind talking to us about the STAR method and how can that be beneficial to folks as they gear sure, up? Sure, sure. Uh, really quickly, um, so at the Workforce Development Council, we're really big in trying to get our employees and our employers uh, to use what we call competency-based hiring, competency-based uh, interview skills, competency-based um, answers and all of that. And so when you're talking about a competency-based interview, you're going to get those questions where they say, tell me about a time when you didn't get along with your last boss, or tell me about a time you had a really short deadline. And so a good strategy that I've found and many have said works really well for them is use what Ephra said, the star technique. And that's you describe the situation you, you talk about the task at hand, you talk about what you did, what the action was, and then you talk about what the result was. So you don't have to take it personally, um, you know, you don't wanna bad mouth anybody, but really give an understanding of, you know, what was going on in your world, um, what did you need to do, how did you do it, and then what was the result? Thank you. Okay, I wanna mention that um, all of the panelists linked in links or page um, is chat in the chat. So if you haven't gone into the chat yet, uh, please do that and reach out to the panelists. Also, um, there are a couple of resources that I think will get posted in the chat. And so what my last tip was, you know, there's so many resources out there working for the state. I obviously got to make the plug. There's a great program out there called My Colorado Journey. Um, the state job board is connecting Colorado and then there's a wealth of information out there that is free, it's accessible, um, and I really encourage you to use some of those resources. So I think we have a little bit of time now and I'm looking to see if Norma tells me what I can do or what I can't do. Um, there are the resources uh, posted. Um, if, the, if it's not links, Google searches work really well. Um, I want to give opportunity to pull in some of these questions that I saw and I'll try to do them in order and I'll try to, if they've already been answered or I think they've been answered, I might skip them. So feel free to jump in. But in the time we have left, um, here's a question from Luke and I'll invite any of the panelists to answer. How valuable is an industrial organizational master's degree to be in the HR world? I don't have one and I've been successful in the HR world. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I agree. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I am a huge advocate for education, so it cannot hurt you. <laughs> I, and, and I do know that I have an MBA and I do believe that the skills that I got from my master's program was, was helpful in my day-to-day business thinkings, right? I mean, one thing that we don't talk about when you get to HR leadership, you, I probably crunch more numbers than I, than I got to engage with people, right? Um, so I will say, um, will it hurt? No. Does it put you over the top, I think? I, I, I don't want to say yes, and I don't want to say no. I, I, I think anytime you can expand your knowledge base, that's something that you should absolutely do, but I do think you can find success in human resources without it. Just as a quick example, um, I work almost on a daily basis with two folks that have that background, and uh, one of them was straight out of college with her master's degree, and she ended up uh, working in career development for the state. And then she very quickly within months moved to a very uh, prestigious position within the Department of Higher Education. And so she writes reports for us like the talent pipeline report. And those are things that are read and appreciated by HR professionals, by workers, by employers. And so that's a knowledge set and that's a skill set that is highly valuable. You might not do what you think normal HR might look like, but definitely HR related and super applicable. Lots of jobs out there. Okay, here's a good one that I think you can answer. Uh, what does corporate culture mean to you? Wow. 
Well, I think that's good. By the, oh, I'll, I'll be quiet on that. I think that's good by the organization. <laughs> but go for it. You, so I think it's um, it's a good question. I'm not sure exactly where it's coming from, but I will do my best to kind of to give an answer. I, I think that um, you know. Ours is a culture where we do tend to promote from within. Uh, there is quite a bit of, you know, there is a, a learning curve um, in sort of working for a company of, of our size, I would say, um, especially if you're going to come into it right out of college. So there, you know, there is a, a training class right up front for any new hire that we have that is literally is, and it's a four to eight hour class, depending on which um, segment of the company that you work for, but um, it is literally just about our, our corporate culture um, and some of the expectations and some of the guidelines and just some of the ways that we work together. I think it also, you know, in, in a company of our size, it can really vary. I've seen it vary. I started working in theme parks. I now work for corporate. Um, and so I've worked with, you know, studio productions, ABC, ESPN, all of it, and I think they all have a little bit slightly different culture to them. Um, and so it does it does play a role. And even in my move this year from talent acquisition over to the compensation team, I've been telling a lot of people on my old team, like, wow, it just, it's again, very different. So I think, you know, um, it, it can vary uh, is my response to that. It, it can really be as small as the culture on your local team to the culture of the organization at large. But I do agree with a lot of what Amber was saying earlier about just making sure that you do your research and understand what the values of the company are, because no matter where I go, I think in, in, in the various segments that I've worked with, really some of those top values are, are, are still the same. And that's what's kept me here really for as long as, as I've been here as well, is that it is a good fit culturally for me. All right, we are quickly coming up on time, but I'm gonna try to combine a couple of questions. Um, questions from uh, Carlos and Isaiah. Um, they're asking, you know, what kind of courses should they take in HR? Um, what kind of, are there things in the college plan that they should add that would be helpful in an HR career? You know, I, I don't know, right? It's, I guess it's been a while since I've been at UNC, right? But I think, you know, folks are talking about diversity of thought. And I think right now, you know, given the bigger world and where we're at and how people are looking at organizations and the values that, you know, the organization aligns with and where the money of that organization is going, right? I think it's important to be a critical uh, individual in the, in the field of HR and understand what it means to work with individuals from different backgrounds, what it means to be biased and how do your biases come out in the work that you do and how can you continue to overcome and work those. Um, I think as we continue to move on to the workforce, I think diversity and inclusion and being able to be critical about yourself and the work that you're doing is gonna be a valuable tool, right? I think we're, we're seeing it a lot with our younger generations too. So I would say if there's something where you can challenge yourself and become uncomfortable and learn and grow um, from DNI, I would definitely recommend that personally. Yeah, I, I would have to agree as well. We talked a lot today about transferable skills. And so just think about those classes that you take that interest you, how are they transferable and think about those pieces. But I also agree with Ephra that, um, you know, organizational development is huge. Diversity and inclusion is huge. Um, communication is huge, building relationships. So any classes that would help you develop those skills um, leadership skills are, are huge as well. So there's a wide variety of classes that you could take that would be transferable. So it, you also want to combine with what you enjoy and also with what your career path looks like. So think about that too. I would definitely focus on um, where you want your career path to go as well. Um, I know for myself earlier in my career, it was really kind of some of those HR one-on-ones early easier things, right? And then as my career grew, it became more, I wish I had paid more attention in accounting. <laughs> um, I wish I had paid more attention in finance. Um, so don't dismiss those classes. Um, dig down into your ethics courses, dig down into your um, employment law. Um, it was really trying to go back into the memory bank and say, Ooh, I don't remember much of this. And, and it's, it's vital. It's a part of your every day. Um, so I, I would definitely say off the top of my head, it's been a little bit of a while since I've been an undergrad, um, but I, I would dig down and focus in those areas as well. So 
So we are at time. I want to thank all of our panelists for today's discussion. Really great information. I realize that we didn't get to all the questions that were asked, um, but I do um, ask you to look at your local career center, go to the UNC Career Center, um, ask some of these questions, um, reach out to the panelists through their LinkedIn and ask these questions. Um, I really enjoyed my time. I feel honored to have worked with all these alumni that I didn't meet when I was at UNC. So it was great to meet you afterwards. I'll turn it over now to our, our hosts, uh, Norma or Christina. It was um, great being able to sit with you and learn from you. Um, thank you so much and go Bears. Go Bears. Go Bears. <laughs> go Bears. Good luck everyone. Yes. <laughs> Good luck. Bye y'all.